All right, today we're going to talk about quadratic equations and functions. So a quadratic, remember, is just a polynomial of degree 2. And if we look at kind of the difference between an equation, that's kind of a definition. We'll just put definition for right now. Um, so a quadratic equation is one, you know, an equation has an equal sign, right, and is usually set equal to some number. And if I want, I can move everything over to one side. And if I can write an equation in this form, then we say that this is a quadratic equation. I don't want you to worry so much about, um, you know, defining like the, I mean, it's, it's an equation obviously um, versus a function, but let's just write this down where a is not zero because if a was zero, then I wouldn't have a square term and it wouldn't be a quadratic anymore. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about a quadratic equation where, where are a, b, and c, a, b, and c are elements of, use a little bit of fancy math notation for you, elements of the real numbers, right? They're real numbers. Whereas a quadratic function, if we just look at you know, quadratic equations and quadratic functions are similar, but a function maybe we're not worried about, you know, where that quadratic equation maybe is set equal to zero, but we're just looking at all the points, right, or all the values that satisfy this guy right here. So I have ax squared plus bx plus c, again, where a is not equal to zero or else we don't have a quadratic and a, b, and c are real numbers. So um, that's what we're kind of talking about here. If I have a quadratic equation in this form, we say that that is the standard form. Um, and if I think about the relationship between the function and the quadratic equation, you know, if we set this equal to zero, which is kind of what we have um, up here, then what that does is that gives us the zeros of the function or the roots. So that's what, if I set this guy equal to zero and make it a quadratic equation, this gives us the zeros or the roots of that function. Because look at what you're asking. You're asking where are my function values equal to zero. So basically that's asking where do we cross the x-axis. Remember x-intercepts are where my y values are zero. So we're going to kind of look today about how do I solve quadratic equations. Um, there are a couple ways that we can do this. We're going to, you know, hang out with the quadratic formula a little bit today. Um, we're going to start, though, by completing the square. And I will ask you to be solving equations using completing the square. So I know, you know, the quadratic formula, but completing the square is important, too. Um, I know sometimes it seems like we just make you to do it just to make you do it, but we actually do complete the square in like calculus when we want to take integrals of things. Um, so completing the square can be important. Like if I wanted to find the, the center of a circle, also I would need to complete the square to define the center of the circle if it wasn't in standard form. So that's my rationale and my defense for uh, completing the square. So a couple things. Um, that we need and your book we can we can I can use what your book calls them equation solving principles that I want to remind you about and it's actually good that we kind of talk about it right now because we're going to need these whoa that line was crazy so the first principle we need is the principle of zero products and I'm not um going to write this out but what this says is that if I have two things multiplied to be zero if a times b equals zero okay then a equals zero or b equals zero and we can actually go the other way also if a is zero or if b is zero then a times b is zero makes sense right you've seen this before and um, this is only true with multiplication and it's only true if we're equal to zero if it's equal to like five we can't say that a is five or b is five why is this property true because the only way i can multiply two numbers and get zero is for one of those to be zero so i need you to think about that like Maybe sit in a quiet place like I had a teacher used to tell me. Sit in a quiet place and just kind of think about that. Um, if I have two numbers equal or two things equal to zero, then either A must be zero or B must be zero. And this one could be zero and this one could not be, but I'm still going to get zero. That's why I have the two solutions. So that's the first equation solving principle. Again, that's called the principle of zero products. And then the principle of square roots that we're going to need also because we're dealing with quadratics is... If I have x squared equal to some number k, k doesn't have to be a real number. We can let it be, um, I'm sorry, has to be, <laughs> um, uh, has to be a real number, but it doesn't have to be positive. 
then remember when you square root anytime you bring in a square root you got to consider the positive root or the negative root so anytime you bring in a square root that wasn't there before you have to think about the plus or minus let me say that one more time anytime you bring in a square root to get rid of that squared oh i forgot my square root sorry guys um a square root that wasn't there you need to remember to bring in a plus or a minus and that's that's because we know you know um, if I have x squared equals 4, there are two numbers that actually, if I square them, equals 4. There's 2 and there is negative 2. So what this does is it takes care of thinking about the positive root. This gives me the positive root and the negative root. That guy gives me the negative root. All right, so how do we solve quadratic equations? These should be pretty simple. We have actually already done some of these because we'll... Um, because we have dealt with domain and so like if I had something like x squared minus 3x minus 15 equals 0 when we solve quadratic equations the first thing we're going to try and do is factor if you can't factor it then we're going to have to do something else but in this case I just want to start off with kind of an easy one let's factor this this would be x minus 5 times x plus 2 equals zero and now what we're going to use is that principle of zero products principle of principle of zero products yeah principle of zero products <laughs> remember i look at i have two things multiplied together to be zero so either one of those must be zero right or another way to think of that is if just one of them is zero then the whole thing is zero so what are my solutions my solutions are x equals five or negative 2. And if you look at this, we don't know this quite yet, but quadratics actually are parabolas. And when we talk about the zeros of this, what that means is I go through 5 and negative 2. Also, look at what my y-intercept is. My y-intercept is negative 15 all the way down here. That's not a great <laughs> picture of it, but ah, and that should go through negative 2, but you know what I mean. This is what we mean. These are my zeros of the function because they are where I cross the x-axis. So this is solving my quadratic, the um, algebraic way. This would be solving my a quadratic, the um, graphic way. Graphic way. Um, what about something like this? Um, 4x squared minus, I don't know, uh, 5 equals 0. So here I could factor here 4x squared minus 5. I can't really factor, but that's okay because look at what I have. We have a single term with an x. Up here I didn't have a single term with an x, so I couldn't isolate x by itself, right? That's why we had to factor it and try and solve. Here, look at I have a single term, so I can actually isolate the term that contains the x in it. I'm going to add the 5 over. I'm going to divide by 4, so I get x squared equals 5 fourths, and now I need to use that principle of square roots. Remember, any time you bring in a square root that was not there originally, you must bring in that plus or minus. Remember, you can break square roots up over division. That's okay. Your math teachers are not going to freak out about that. Just try and break up square roots over addition or subtraction, though, and, and see your math teacher's head explode. <laughs> um, square at the top is just square root of 5. I can't do anything with that. Square root of 4 is 2. So what are my zeros for this function? Well, they're a little irrational, but that's okay. We still like them. It would be a positive root 5 over 2 and a negative root 5 over 2. And I'm pretty sure if you're doing this homework in my math lab, they want you to list these separately. I will accept a plus or a minus um, for your solutions on like a test or a quiz, but go ahead and list them separately in my math lab. So again, two kind of ways we can do this. So if I have a quadratic where I have two x terms, um, I'm going to have to factor it. If I have a quadratic where I only have one x squared term, we can usually solve for that x squared term and then bring in that um, square root. Now sometimes... We don't always stay real. Sometimes we get imaginary, right? So what if I had um, something like x squared plus 16 equals 0? Again, I can solve for that x squared term. x squared equals a negative 16. We saw this in the last section. If I square root, again, plus or minus the square root of a negative 16. Don't forget the plus or minus. What's the square root of a negative 16? It's 4i. That negative becomes i, and the square root of 16 is 4. So what does this mean algebraically? Well, 
well, that's what it means algebraically. What does this mean graphically? Guys, you know what this is. This is the square root of x. Remember, this is a parabola, and it's shifted up 16. I'm going to make that 16. So that's what my parabola looks like, right? We've dealt with that before, how to graph those. And so what this is saying is I don't have any zeros in the real numbers. Remember, the Cartesian coordinate system is in the real numbers. So um, I don't have, I don't cross the x-axis. I have two imaginary or complex solutions, but I don't have two real solutions to this equation or real zeros, okay? Um, I hope this is kind of uh, making sense. So that's kind of how we uh, simplified that. One other one really quick. What if we had something like um, 4x squared uh, minus 20x plus 25 equals zero. Let me make sure that's going to work. I think it's going to work. <laughs> so we're going to factor this. I believe I'll let you factor it however you want. You can factor by grouping or um, guess and check. You know, however you factor trinomials. If you have problems factoring, you got to get some help. So email me or talk to someone that can factor. <laughs> so look at here. If I, if I set this guy equal to zero, and when I set this guy equal to zero, Nope, that's not plus. I see it. I see it. Don't yell at me. 2x minus 5. <clears throat> Excuse me. What do I get? I get x equals 5 halves in this case. And over here, I also get x equals 5 halves. That's okay. We'll talk about what that means later on, that that's a, a solution with multiplicity too. But we just, we don't have to list 5 halves twice. We just say the solution is 5 halves. And what that does is that's the graph of something. So 5 halves is, is about 2 and a half. What happens is that parabola comes down and it touches that 5 halves. I know it opens up. We'll talk about that because there's a positive number for the x squared. But it's going to open up and it's just going to come down, grab the x-axis right there. And it's what we call its vertex and come back up. So it does have a 0. It's just it only has 1. Okay. That was pretty fast about how to solve quadratics using um, factoring or just isolating your x squared term. But those should be pretty... You should be pretty familiar with that, I would think, um, at this stage in your math career. So let's talk about solving by completing the square. And then we'll, we'll look at the quadratic formula. It's going to be a bit of a long lecture. And um, actually, maybe we'll do the applications in a separate lecture. But solve by completing the square. So. Um, completing the square, um, so, so some rules of completing the square, right? If I have, let's say I have something like x squared plus, um, I, I, to complete the square, what you must have is you must have a 1 in front of the uh, x squared term, okay? So the idea here is that I want to get a perfect square on the left-hand side so that I can solve something that is not factorable, okay? And so I don't know if you remember how we did this, but if I took x squared plus bx, remember what the trick was. You've probably seen this before, but let me refresh your memory. What we do is we want to bring in something. I'm going to take half of b. So what is half of b? It's b over 2, and I'm going to square it. So I'm just going to put a little squared here. I'm not going to say they're equal because they're not equal. And if I square that b over 2, I get b squared over 4. I don't want you to worry so much about memorizing stuff like this. Um, what I want you to do is just remember the process of it. I'm going to bring the c over here. Again, I don't want you to memorize the steps that I'm doing right here. What I want you to remember is that to complete the square, we take half the middle term, or the middle coefficient, not term, and square it. And then add it to both sides, okay? Square it and add to both sides. Now, why does that work? Well, if you look at this side right here, look at what I have now. I have x squared plus bx plus b squared over 4. Let me show you that becomes x plus b over 2 quantity squared. And let me show you why that works. This becomes x plus b over 2, right, times x plus b over 2. So here's why that taking half and squaring it works. If I FOIL this, I get x squared, okay, 
I get half of b, right, or b over 2 times x. Inside, I also get half of b, or b over 2 times x. And then last, look at what I get. I get b squared over 4. And maybe you're like, why are we even doing this, Sarah? I'm going to show you. I'll show you why. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, <clears throat> so look at what I get here. I get half of b plus half of b. Well, what does that make? That makes a whole b, where it gives you 2b over 2. And then I get b times x all plus b squared over 4, not over 4 squared. Why did you do that, Sarah? You guys yelling at the screen right now. My fault. My fault. My fault. Um, all right. So look at what I get. So what, what I've done is I've added this term. And the whole reason I added this term is so that I get something like this that can be written as a perfect square. And I'm going to show you why we want to do this. So the weight is over. Let me show you why we would, hmm. okay, I understand, calm down. Let me show you why I would even want to do this. So for example, let's say I had something like, um, I'm actually going to go a little lighter. That's a little tough to see. Sorry about that. For example, let's say I had something like x squared plus 4x plus 1 equals 0. Okay, I actually, sorry, I don't want to use 4. Because then I just get too many 4s and sometimes it doesn't make sense. Let's look at x squared plus 6x plus 1 equals 0. So notice this guy doesn't factor, right? I can't find any two numbers that multiply to be 1 that would add to be 6, obviously. So what I want to do is I'm going to get my x terms by themselves. Okay, so get your x terms by itself. I'm going to put that negative 1 over here. And then what I want is I want, remember, I want to find... Basically, I can't solve this right now because I have two x terms, okay? I have an x squared term and I have a 6x term, and that means I can't really solve it as is. So what I want is if I can get a perfect square on this side, then I'll be able to square root and kind of get rid of both of my x terms. I don't think I'm being very clear, so let me just show you. So this 6 right here, so I'm messing with my... There we go. I'm going to take half of it. Remember, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to take half of the middle coefficient. What is half of 6? It's 3. And then what am I going to do to that 3? I'm going to square it. So the t number I'm going to bring in, let me get rid of that. I want to keep the same color. The number I am going to bring in, if I actually grab my pen, is 9. All right, so I bring in 9. Now I'm going to show you why that's going to happen. But what you do to one side, you got to stay balanced, right? I have to do to the other. Now, why did this work? Because look at this guy right here. If we factor this, what is this going to factor into? Two numbers that multiply to be a positive 9 and add to be 6. That's going to be x plus 3 times x plus 3. Or I can rewrite that as x plus 3 quantity squared. Do you see that? Now, why is this a good thing? Because if I can write it as a perfect square, do you see how I only have one x term now? This is good, because now I'm ready to solve for x. My whole goal is to solve for x. So again, what, what are we going to do? We're going to take half that middle term, find what that number is, and square it. And if you notice, whatever this number is right here is going to be the number that goes right here for um, for when you actually complete the square, I promise. All right, now how would I solve this? I'm going to square root both sides, get rid of that squared, remembering to bring in a plus or a minus. I really hope you have, like, my voice in your head. Well, that's a little creepy, but I want you to, like, dream about you bring in a plus or minus when you bring in a square root. All right, so square root of 8. Um, remember, 8 is 4 times 2, so I can square root the 4. The other two just has to stay in, poor guy. And I'm almost done. So look at how great that is now because I square rooted that squared. I have a term with just an x in it, so I'm going to subtract 3 from both sides. And here's the form we're used to writing this in. I would do a negative 3 plus or minus 2 root 2. So what are my two solutions? 3 plus 2 root 2 and negative 3 minus 2 root 2. So if we graphed this parabola, I have two real solutions. They're irrational, but that's OK. Um, I, and I could approximate these in my calculator. I get a negative 3 plus 2 root 2 and a negative 3 minus 2 root 2. So this is a one way. And if you use the quadratic formula, which we will get to, I promise, if you use the quadratic formula, you're going to get this also. But again, completing the square is important. Um, and let's do another one so we can kind of see how to keep, how to do this. Oh, come on. I swear I had, obviously I had not. 
I like to blame the computer for my mistakes. All right, so let's do um, another example. So what about, let's say, 2x squared um, minus 1. I'm going to grab one from your book because I like this one. Equals 3x. All right, my first step, I'm going to bring that 3x over. And I should say here, solve by completing the square. Okay. Now, what I would do first, if I just gave you a bunch of ones to solve and I didn't tell you how to solve it, um, try and factor. I mean, that's what you're going to try and do. And this one actually doesn't factor. So to complete the square, remember, I have to have a 1 in front of the x squared term. And I need to move this one over. So let's just take this step by step. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the 1 over. Okay, now again to complete the square I need to have a 1 in front of the x squared term because I just want an x. I don't want to get complicated where I have to think about a coefficient in, term in front of the x squared term. So I divide everything by 2. Notice how I'm leaving a space because I'm going to complete the square, obviously. All right, so I'm going to take half of a negative 3 halves. Write this out. Don't try and do this in your head. I see when students try and do it in their head, they make mistakes because it's easy to mistake, make mistakes when you're dealing with fractions. So half of a negative 3 halves, I just multiply straight across. Easiest thing we do with fractions. And now I'm going to square this sucker, remembering to square everything. So when I square a negative 3 fourths, that becomes a positive, right? And I would get a positive square the numerator, that's a 9, square the denominator, that's 16. What I do to one side, though, the math gods say thou shalt do to the other, right? <laughs> I know, I know, I'm cracking myself up. I know. All right, so what is this going to factor into? I want two numbers that multiply to be a positive 9 sixteenths, but add to be a negative 3 halves. Hey, guys, it's sitting right here. Remember, it's always whatever this number is. And that number is negative, so we are going to have x minus 3 fourths quantity squared, okay, is going to equal, let's get a common denominator here. This would be what, 8 sixteenths plus 9 sixteenths. My common denominator is 16, so I multiply this by 8 over 8. And what do we get? 17 sixteenths. That's a good enough number as any. And now again, now that I have completed the square, right, I have a perfect square, now I can square root both sides. Remembering to bring in dun, 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 a plus or minus. Okay, So x minus 3 fourths, we're almost there, people, okay, is going to give me plus or minus square root of 17. It's just the square root of 17. Not much you can do with that. Square root of 16 is 4. And now to solve finally for x, I'm going to add the 3 fourths over. Add the 3 fourths, but we usually notation-wise put that first. So I get x equals 3 fourths plus or minus root 17 over 4. And we can actually even bring those together if we wanted to and make that. So what are my two solutions? 3 plus root 17 over 4, because they have a common denominator and 3 minus root 17 all over 4. I hope that makes sense. So again, irrational solutions, that's okay. We can have irrational solutions. We can have non-real solutions, right? Um, but that's those are what my solutions look like when I have completed the square. So again, to complete the square, you must have a 1 in front of the x squared term. Once you've gotten that, take half of the middle term, square it, and add that number to both sides of the equation, okay? Then you can rewrite that left-hand side. Now, what that does, remember, what that does for you when you bring that guy in is it forces this thing on the left to be a perfect square polynomial, meaning I can write it as x minus or plus something quantity squared, okay? I really, really recommend not just memorizing that I add b squared over 4 to each side. Go ahead and go through the steps. What if you forget it's b squared over 4? What if you do b over 4? Go through the steps. Half the middle term, square it, add it to both sides, okay? It's hard. I, I know there are a lot of tricks for memorizing things, but I caution you on that. Um, understand why you're doing it, and then it'll be easier to remember um, how to do it if you understand why, okay? Um, good. Hope that makes sense. Let's talk about the quadratic formula. Okay, so as much as I love completing the square, and I do, I mean, who wouldn't? Um, sometimes we need to go a little faster, right? Sometimes we need to be able to find solutions without having, I mean, it's a bummer, right? 
I would be so sad if I didn't have time to complete the square to solve a quadratic equation. However, sometimes we need to get solutions quickly, and so we need some sort of formula. So the quadratic formula, I am going to prove this for you, because why wouldn't I? You know what it is, but have you seen it proved? It's pretty awesome. So let's say quadratic formula says, okay, so, so if we want to create a formula, what we want to say is, all right, I want to solve a quadratic. I'm going to take the most general form possible for that quadratic. So I'm going to do ax squared plus bx plus c, where a is not zero. And now I'm going to solve this guy by completing the square. All right, it's going to be fun. So what I'm going to do is divide everything by a. I could have, I guess, taken the c over first. So remember to complete the square, I must have a one in front of, I hope I'm going to give myself enough room here. I'm getting all excited about proving this for you. I must have a one in front of the x squared term. Okay, I'm going to move that c over a to the right hand side. And I'm going to give myself some space. So I get a negative c over a over here. So remember what completing the square tells me to do. It tells me to take half of the middle term. Look at I'm just doing what I've been told to do. Half of the middle term, right? And then what are we going to do with that? We're going to square it. I know these aren't equal. I probably shouldn't put an equal sign. Let's just put an arrow. That's bothering me that I'm putting an equal sign. <laughs> I'm a mathematician. I, I, that bothers me. So what, when I complete the square, what am I going to add to both sides? I'm going to add b squared over. Now, instead of having just 4, it's actually going to be 4a squared. Because remember, we had to divide everything by that a. So what am I going to add to both sides? The term that I'm adding to both sides is half that middle term squared. So that's b squared over 4a squared. All right, so now I can rewrite the left-hand side as a perfect square. So it's going to be x, and then remember, this guy right here, right, is what's going to be in the middle. Now, I'm just putting plus. If b happens to be negative, then this this will be minus, right? So the b can be positive or negative. All right, so I got x plus b over 2a quantity squared. That's what this whole polynomial here is going to factor into, like we saw before. Now let's do a little bit of work here with this guy. Let's get a common denominator. So what's my common denominator? It's going to be 4a squared, right? So this guy needs a 4, and it only has 1a, so it needs an a. Look at this. this if you know the quadratic formula, this looks like what we think it should be. So I'm going to rewrite this as a negative 4ac. Then what? Plus b squared. All over, what's my common denominator? 4a squared. Oh, this is so cool. So look at what we get on the right-hand side. We get b squared minus 4ac all over 4a squared. You guys, you guys, so great. All right, I'm ready to solve for x. I'm going to square root both sides, remembering what do we bring in. So I'm going to move over here a little bit. I know, a plus or minus, Sarah. I know. All right, so I'm going to bring in a plus or minus because when I have, I'm trying to save myself some room here a little bit. You know, if I had thought about this a little bit, I would have thought about this a little bit. So let's square root this. So the top I'm going to just leave as, and I'm going to just put the plus or minus with the top. I can't simplify that at all because I don't know what a, b, and c are, and you may not break up square roots over subtraction, don't you dare. So it's just going to be the square root of b squared minus 4ac. But the bottom I can square root. What is the bottom? What's the square root of the bottom? Well, the square root of 4 is 2. What's the square root of a squared? It's a. Isn't that cool? All right, you guys. Here we go. I'm going to make some room here. Ah, oh, sorry. Hold on. I'm actually going to erase all of this and we're going to come back up to the top because I want to actually write down what the quadratic formula is. <laughs> so look at this. We're almost there. This looks familiar to you, I'm sure. What am I going to do here to solve for x? I'm going to subtract b over 2a. That's where that negative b comes from. Subtract b over 2a. And then we're just going to put it in the front. So here, I feel like there should be music playing. I really need to get on the ball with that. Um, if I put these two together, they have a common denominator. I get negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, you don't. I shouldn't do that. You shouldn't have me do that. That's my answer, you guys. So that's what, that's what we mean by the quadratic formula. So I wanted you to see that because I want you to see that this is not some 
like formula that's out of reach of all the students. This is something that you can understand because we're using something we've used before, which is the, which is completing the square. So there is, I think there's a cubic formula, but it's much more complicated than this. I don't know it actually, it's pretty involved um, for how to solve like a cubic, uh, but that's a quadratic formula. What the formula does for us is it allows us to solve quadratic equations a little bit, you know, if we're not feeling, you know, we, we, we got to get to a party, a math party or something. Uh, and I have all these quadratic equations to solve. And I maybe just don't have time to complete the square, which is a sad, sad situation, I have to say. I would be very, very sad if I didn't have time to complete the square. But sometimes you just don't, you guys. Sometimes you just don't have time to complete the square. Let's look at this one. We already did this one by completing the square, but let's verify that we get the same answer. So I'm going to let a equal 2. I'm going to let b equal a negative 3. Well, I'm not going to let these guys equal that. These are, are what a, b, and c are. Remember, my quadratic formula is for the form this. So if you do not have it in standard form, you need to get it in standard form and then figure out what a, b, and c are. So here's what my quadratic formula tells me to do. It tells me to take the opposite sign of b. Opposite sign of b in this case is 3 plus or minus the square root of, you must put this negative 3 in parentheses. I will count off if you don't put it in parentheses. It's not the same thing. Remember, this is negative 9. This is 9. They're different. They're different. Oh, sir, you're being so picky. Yes, I am, because I'm right. And because math doesn't care what you meant, math cares what you actually put. And then this is, okay, so 4ac all over 2a, which is 2 times 2. All right, let's see what we got then. We have 3 plus or minus the square root of, so I get here, I get 9. Now here, I have, my students have trouble with this, and I'm not sure why, but um, look at what we're going to get. We're going to get a negative 8, basically, times a negative 1. Or if you notice here, I have two negatives. Because it's all multiplication, that's going to become positive. So that'll be just plus 8, and this is all over 4. So look at what my final answer is. We saw this before, 3 plus or minus the square root of 17 all over 4. And all is right in the world. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but all is right right now in this lecture because we got the same solution that we got before. That is so great. Let's do another one. I, I As much as I like completing the square, I totally the quadratic formula is pretty fun. Also, I have to say. All right, let's look at, I'm going to grab another one from your book. 3x squared equals 7 minus 2x. Okay, so again, I'm going to solve this. I'm going to move everything. This is not in standard form, so I need to move everything over. So I get 3x squared plus 2x minus 7. Now, if I was, again, if no one told me how to solve it, I would always try and factor. It'll be faster. Try and factor it. This one's not going to factor, so let's see kind of um, what's going to happen here. So I'm going to let a equal 3, not let. b is 2, c is a negative 7. So again, quadratic formula then, x equals the opposite of b, which is negative 2, plus or minus. And I don't know if I said this, it probably goes without saying, but you have to have the quadratic formula memorized. It will not give you that on the test. 4 times a times c, c is a negative 7, okay, all over 2 times a, which is 3. Okay, so let's simplify this. Negative 2 plus or minus 2 squared. I didn't need parentheses here because 2 is positive. 4 here, I got two negatives, right, is it positive? Um, I have 12 times 7, <laughs> 84. I think 12 times 7 is 84, um, all over 6. So let's keep going a little bit. And this guy, what we're going to see is we're going to be able to simplify. So I get 2 plus or minus the square root of 88 all over 6. OK, I need everyone out there to listen to me. You may not cancel the 2 and the 6 right now. Please understand that. This 6 right now is dividing the negative 2, and the 6 is dividing the square root of 88. You may not cancel right here, because then that we don't have a 6 dividing the square root of 88. We will be able to simplify this a bit, but you may not do that right now, okay? Please, please, on behalf of all the math teachers out there, for the love of math, please do not cancel those, okay? I can only cancel if I have multiplication. 
can only cancel if I have multiplication. I can only cancel if I have multiplication. I mean, I have issues, right? But half of those issues are because students try and cancel over addition and subtraction or try and break up square roots over addition and subtraction. It drives me batty and every other math teacher out there. But we love you guys. So, you know, we'll keep saying it over and over. All right, square root of 88, that's 4 times 22. So I'm going to take the square root of 4, which is 2. Square root of 22 is just going to have to hang out. Now, what can we do? Okay, guys, now I get it. I get it. I want to cancel as well. I understand. It's a good time. So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to factor a 2 out so that my math teacher's head doesn't explode when I try and cancel over addition and subtraction because it's a plus or minus. So once I factor that 2 out, notice I have a 2 common to both of these, right? So I'm going to factor out that 2. Now, oh, that's better. Now I can cancel a 2 with a 6 because this is multiplication, people, because it's multiplication and not addition or subtraction. Don't you dare. All over 3. There's my final answer right there. Okay, I want to do one more example because what I would like to talk about, um, I just want to do one example with um, where you get, sorry, I'm stalling a little bit because I'm trying to get you an example where we get a non-real solution, which um, we'll talk about that when we talk about discriminants. So I could actually be figuring this out while I'm sitting here because um, because I could figure out my discriminants. Oh, wow. Goodness. Sorry about that. Um, so let's try this one. I think this one might work. <laughs> Maybe. Um, let's try x squared. Um, okay, I found one out. Okay, so x squared, let's do plus 2x plus 2. Let's see how this works equals 0. So I can't factor it, right? I can't find two numbers that multiply to be 2 and then add to be 2. So what are my values here? I have a is 1. There's a 1 in front of the x squared term. b is 2, right? And c is 2. So let's plug that into the quadratic formula. Opposite of b, negative 2, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 4, minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is 2, all over 2a. Don't you dare cancel those 2s. I knew you were going to do it. Don't you dare. Don't you dare cancel those 2s. <laughs> I know, I get a little freaky about it here. I get 4 minus 8. So I wanted to do one like this because we get a negative under the square root. That is fine. All over 2. Don't you dare cancel those 2s. So we get a negative 2 plus or minus. What is a negative square root of negative 4? That's 2i all over 2. Now, I can divide each 2 by 2, and that would be fine. And what I get then, my final answer, is a negative 1 plus or minus i. Okay. So that's an example of using the quadratic formula to find non-real solutions as well as real. Again, how did I get one, negative 1? Technically, here's what happened. I took a 2 out. I get negative 1 plus or minus i all over 2, and my 2's cancel. That's technically what has happened, or I am fine if you do that in your head as long as that 2 goes into each one. All right, guys, that was just the first part. We still have a lot more fun to have um, talking about this stuff. We're going to talk about some um, applications, talk about the discriminant and what the discriminant tells us about solutions, um, and then that'll be it. All right, thanks.